for what you're trying to communicate. In the verbal communication, we know that one of the most important ones is face-to-face -face communication. It has the highest information richness, cannot get better than this. And why it is very high is because it takes into uh, effect both uh, the spoken, um, that is the verbal communication, as well as non-verbal communication, which we saw from Mehrabin's work, the non-verbal communication, including body language, voice, etc., is also extremely important. Um, it's also a communication method that, that provides instant feedback. Um, that is why um, there is something called management by wandering, which is, for example, a CEO will get up from his or her chair and then go around the organization, maybe go on the, um, uh, the floor or maybe to a different part of the building or um, a production environment and start talking to people and getting their feedback. And uh, talk to people on the spot. You can get a lot of feedback from people um, without having to go through uh, multiple managers trying to talk to people and messages getting lost. And um, the second one is that if, if you can't do face-to-face, uh, -face, then uh, video conferencing can also is also a form of face-to-face -face communication. Um, and, and it provides a good amount of uh, richness of media. And it might actually suit a lot of organizations where you give up on um, a little bit of um, the, uh, the, the actual people sitting in front of each other uh, having that effect, the personal effect, but retaining a lot of those, a lot of that richness, but at a cost that's a fraction of um, bringing people together in person. Now, this can be very important for organizations. Um, for businesses to make a judgment of balance between, um, say, in this case, the information richness of the media and cost is a very important one. And the top managers of the company and leaders of the company, the CEO of the organization, will have some influence on which methods to use um, to at least ensure a, a certain, a good amount of uh, information richness in the media, but do it at a cost that actually the company or the organization can um, afford. So that's why a lot of organizations um, utilize critical travel where people can go across to different places, different countries, different cities, and utilize verbal communication but uh, there's a lot of other verbal communication happening through video conferencing where people could travel if they, if they um, wanted to, but the organization has advised that travel for such verbal communication is not required. Uh, video conferencing would be enough. And it again depends upon the importance, the critical um, impact that verbal communication has on business. Within the verbal communication, uh, as we uh, discussed earlier, um, it's spoken. Uh, spoken communication uh, transmitted, say, for example, through phone. It has also very high information richness because um, you can hear my voice, you can hear the tone of the voice, um, you can, um, I can emphasize on certain words, I may not emphasize on certain words and so on and so forth but there are no non-verbal cues um, i may be making expressions um, which would be uh, very different from uh, what you would expect me to make when i would when i say something and if uh, if you had seen me then that would impact your judgment your interpretation of uh, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to communicate, but since you don't see it, you don't have the information richness that face-to-face uh, -face or a video conferencing has. The other uh, very very common uh, verbal communication that is utilized in organizations is um, is emails, which is uh, even further than lower has lower information richness as compared to say for example. Um, uh, utilizing uh, telephone. 
and um, emails, even if how much we try to make them simple, make them very informative, make them um, uh, putting as much information as we want to in them to ensure that the next person who you're sending the email to is understanding, uh, will understand it correctly. Emails are notorious to be misunderstood. Emails are notorious to be um, um, to not be interpreted the way that you actually wish them, and um, and 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 that's the, and it's inherent because it doesn't have the information richness that we require as a as a medium to transmit a message. It's it's just handicapped. So we try to uh, we try to use email a lot at work and we try to um, um, be hard on ourselves a lot of times to, um, to expect a lot from emails and a lot of time an organization gets lost because people are just writing very long emails. Now emails are important. Emails are important because you need to transmit documents or you need to transmit some uh, written information. Uh, they have a, they have a place, but as managers, you need to um, evaluate whether email is going to be the right medium for your communication, a certain communication. There's a lot of research in um, which medium, which media to use in your communication, and email has been shown to be not so very good. Um, Many, many times just picking up the phone and speaking with someone would actually be of more help. It would make your job easier because it would just take two minutes or five minutes. And it, it has a higher information richness in that media. So there is a higher likelihood that your message went across. It is a good practice to then send a follow up email and confirm what you spoke over the phone. Now that's that's a that's a good practice to do rather than only writing emails. So that would make your emails also shorter because you've done a lot of your talking already. You're just confirming some points here and there as to what you wanted to communicate. Um, and if you're the receiver, then you use the email to confirm your understanding. So you're completing the loop. You're providing the feedback. Now. In the email in itself as a sole medium of communication is a very poor one. And as a manager, you need to not utilize email um, as your only or as your predominant form of communication. It would also keep you away from speaking with people and decreasing your social interaction. So there's a lot of people who actually sit in front of the computers and they believe that they're communicating well enough with everybody around because they write these long emails and they ensure that everything is in those emails, but they send only emails and they never talk to people. And talking to people is also very important in organizations. And if you don't talking to each other, then um, that has its own implications from a social structure in the organization standpoint, from an engagement standpoint. Um, so it, it's, it's, um, it, it means a lot more than just um, using a high information rich medium to transmit your message. Emails also do not provide instant feedback. How many of you have um, uh, and I have written emails and they just go into a black hole? You don't even know uh, whether they were read. You might have a Microsoft Office where it has a it has a thing that tells you when the email was whether the email was opened. It's not considered to be a, a good thing to use because it's annoying. Uh, but if you write an email and now you don't know. You don't know when it was read, how much time was given by the receiver to read it, whether they went through every word of what you wrote or whether you, they just scanned through it for a second. You spent two hours writing the email and the receiver just spent 10 seconds on it, went through it and missed some very important point. It happens all the time in organizations. And um, there's no instant feedback. The, the receiver may decide not to write back at all, thinking that perhaps that was not expected. Um, so, you know, use emails only when they're required. For example, when you, uh, 
uh, have to request follow-ups or you need to send some big diagram that you can't really just talk about over uh, a telephone or in a video conference so you need to send the file so people can have a look at it so email use email as a, a tool that helps in those situations than as a predominant tool for communication we will also um, and I thought this was important, um, especially knowing that body language and um, and nonverbal uh, communication is so important. Uh, to break nonverbal communication into um, its important um, um, kind of um, characteristics or types, uh, the four that we will um, discuss in in this lecture are uh, proxemics. Uh, and we'll go through each one of them. Um, kinesics, facial and um, eye behavior, and paralanguage. Proxemics is an individual's perception and use of space. We'll go through it a little bit more so you'll understand it. Um, kinesics is a study of body movements, including our posture. Um, facial and um, eye behavior is um, the movements of the eye and uh, the expressions of the face, which add very high rich, uh, information rich uh, characteristics to our communication. And paralanguage. Paralanguage is variations in speech, such as when we speak, um, what is our pitch? Say, for example, if someone is angry, they usually raise the pitch of their voice. Um, or if you are uh, talking to someone in confidence and you don't want anybody else to uh, and you want that person to believe that they are the only person who you are telling that thing you whisper um, so um, you know and use use other cues like for example uh, laughing or crying or um, changing the tone of your voice um, can all have an impact on how your message is getting interpreted now let's focus on proxemics Proxemics is uh, the study of personal space. And uh, in that personal space, um, we also use proxemics to define the degree of separation that individuals maintain between each other in social situations. Now, the first important thing to understand in proxemics is that it is different in different cultures. Um, while in one culture, now let's look at a diagram first. Maybe we'll go to that after. If you look at a diagram on the left side, um, there is a person, say for example yourself or, or me, um, in that red zone from, um, uh, the, and, and you will see the red zone. The red zone is what is called the intimate space. So this space is reserved for people who are extremely close to us. So it could be very close family members, uh, could be a spouse, could be a partner, could be someone you um, have a very, 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 very close friend. So this is our intimate space. Um, and from a physical standpoint, they can get very close to us. The second uh, kind of perimeter is the personal space. Now in this personal space, you could have other friends, you could have extended family, you could have other people who you still consider close to you. And then there is social space, which is your acquaintances, people you still know to some extent, but then you don't qualify them necessarily as friends or close friends, but you know them, you know them perhaps by their names or they work with you, they worked with you in the past or they were your neighbors or um, they were your schoolmates or um, your college mates and, and so on and so forth. And then there's public space, which is people, every other person that is around you. When you get on the bus or in a train or in an aircraft or you're in a stadium or walking on the, uh, on the footpath or um, in a, sitting in a restaurant, you're among people that you've perhaps never seen before. Even if you saw them, you wouldn't know them. Now, in, in, in the Western society, like the US, um, uh, there, this has given a lot of um, importance. 
as to how close you can get to a person. In some countries, there's even a legal requirement to be away from a certain person um, if you don't know the per if you don't if you're not within their um, very close family or friends because they wouldn't want you to come that close because it can be considered threatening. Now, but from purely from a proxemic standpoint, um, in a Western sort of society like the U.S., for example. If someone is coming so close to you that it, only 45 centimeters they can come close to you, which is almost stand next to you, they the only people that would qualify for coming into your intimate space would be that very, very small number of people. And, and then you would reserve the personal space, which is around four feet, which is um, uh, around... Uh, uh, say, for example, uh, people that um, uh, who work with you on a day to day basis or say, for example, your neighbors, very close neighbors or other people that you consider are close enough to get into your personal space. Say, for example, people you invite to uh, your birthday party or people you invite to uh, an event that is happening at your residence or at your work. Now. These are people who will get come into close and close spaces uh, with other people and you, um, but they still you, you're still close to them. You still know them. You still know them enough to come to into your personal space, which is around four feet, which is people. For example, you invite people. Social space is somewhere in between then between strangers to uh, close friends or close family and intimate people who are very very close to you. And this is a large one, so it's from 4 feet to 12 feet. Um, this, as I said, um, uh, can have people who you've known and you, your college mates or your friends from the past who are not very close to you anymore. They all come into closed space. And there's public space, which is 12 feet to 25 feet. It's a way to determine um, who is close to you from a communication standpoint who you can talk to, say, for example, um, standing next to you, or who you can talk to um, um, in, in that, uh, from a distance standpoint. Now, as I said at the beginning of this slide, this changes from one culture to the other. In some cultures, um, the intimate space and the personal space can be much larger and will accommodate a lot more people and you will communicate with them within that intimate space and within that personal space. Um, while in some cultures, like for example, Japan, um, the intimate space can be reserved for extremely small number of people. So there are cultural differences in, um, in, in defining the, um, the uh, proxemics. Similarly for kine kinesics, um, it was developed by, uh, um, by, by Ray Birdswistle, who basically um, stated that there is a systemic um, um, background to how people communicate through utilizing um, individual body parts. Uh, one of the very um, universal ones we have are, say, for example, if anybody does this, that means victory. Um, or if anybody does gives a thumbs up, it means either a good job or something, something positive, something good is happening. Um, could be, uh, for example, rolling of the eyes or um, um, holding your chin, for example, in the diagram here. We all um, understand um, most of these and they are cross-cultural which means that they're very universal, they're very systemic. And while there might be differences from one culture to the other, kinesics is a very uh, comprehensive field in terms of uh, communication utilizing individual body parts or the body as a whole. Um, so consider this as a manager when you're in a meeting and you're very casual and you now are intensely discussing some important aspect of your work, you start forgetting your body. You start forgetting how you hold your uh, hands. You start forgetting how you're moving your shoulders. You start forgetting where your hands are. You start forgetting how your eyebrows are doing or 
um, you start uh, not giving these um, important parts of the communication process enough um, attention. And we know that by forgetting or not giving our body uh, or bodily cues enough attention, we may do something that might actually impact the audience more than what you're speaking. Um, again, this requires a lot of practice. Uh, practice, practice, and practice in front of the mirror, in front of other people, in the meetings that you organize or that you're speaking in or you're part of, pick up a colleague or two and ask them to write notes and provide you feedback later on because you want to ensure or get, get your meeting recorded if you can, if it's possible in your organization because what you don't want is that you do not have a complete control or a near complete control or um, at least understanding of your kinesics, um, which is an important part of your communication because what you're doing in the meeting or even when you're meeting a group of your colleagues or um, you're on a video conference, you want to ensure that you are utilizing all the verbal and non-verbal mediums, high information rich mediums to put your uh, point across. Um, so kinesics is very important. Um, paralanguage. Um, paralanguage is when we uh, do things like, for example, we gasp or we sigh, we clear our throats or we change our tone or we whisper or shout, we emphasize on certain words. So we're not actually saying anything. They're not, they're not words. So while I'm speaking, for example, I may focus on certain parts of certain words, or I may raise my tone, or I may lower my tone, or I may do something with my voice, which is my paralanguage. The words are my language, which you're putting the words together to understand what I'm saying, and you're using the paralanguage on top of that to interpret my emotional state, or, or and then understand my whole message to you. So paralanguage is very important. Again, paralanguage um, can have cultural differences. And there's an example on this slide, but there's a lot of such examples. A very simple one is head nodding. So in some cultures, nodding the head, uh, say up and down, means a yes, and nodding a left and right means a no. But in other cultures, it could be reverse. Um, so, understanding the impact of paralanguage, and the one, it's a very funny one though, but it's an important one, is um, that uh, the example on your slide, which is that when you are, when you are speaking across cultural divides or you're speaking across an organization that may be spread out, um, or even within the same cultures, people can have different factors that influence uh, paralanguage. Um, so when as a manager you're communicating with whosoever within the organization or outside the organization, you have to also ensure that you know uh, what impact your paralanguage is going to have. Um, that's why the science and the skill of communication is so important for managers. It's just not about picking up an email and uh, hitting the send button or calling for a meeting and meeting someone and talking about something important. It's much more than that. Here are some examples where, um, if you look at them, um, the negative, and, and this is a risk for organizations because nonverbal cues given out by managers or even some many times non-managers can have negative impact on the organization. Say, for example, a manager or a boss does not acknowledge a staff member's greeting. Now, there, there would be a legitimate reason perhaps for the boss or the manager to uh, not acknowledge. Either they were engrossed in something, they were doing something at the desk and they missed it, 
or they didn't hear or there was say a physical noise or there was something else going on um, or sometimes the issue could be with the person who is say for example in this case the person is greeting maybe maybe the person maybe the employee went too fast or maybe said said it too fast so at the end of the day the impact was that this employee thought that her boss is not not approachable because now she's created a preconceived notion a perception that um, she may have even heard from someone else and now she has a confirmation of that um, behavior that my boss is not approachable um, while the truth may be far from that similarly there are other examples on this slide that you can go through um, where body uh, language and non-verbal cues can have a significantly negative impact on um, the people in the organization especially if you're a manager your circle of influence is much larger the higher you are in the organization as a manager your circle of influence becomes much larger and um, any kind of non-verbal cues that you give out will have an impact will have a negative impact and if you do it correctly and if you do it in a way where you're deliberate and you know what you're doing it will have a positive impact which will impact the organization and will also impact your growth in the organization as a manager or as a leader who knows how to communicate with non